All right, so uh, this is going to be uh, just an another online lecture. So we're just gonna have um, two more of these until the end of the terms. So this is one of one of two. Um, uh, today we are going to start lecture set number 12. Uh, lecture set number 12 is our first simple linear regression. Um, well, actually, sorry, what I should say is it's the only simple linear regression lecture set, but it's the first of two regression lecture sets. And um, this is actually the last unit in the course. So we're getting quite close to the end, as you can imagine now. So we're at 17. So I think we have one, one, two, three, four, five lectures remaining after today. So six total lectures left, including today. Um, all of which will be, well, the, the majority of which will be devoted to studying regression analysis. Um, and then we will probably have time for a review lecture or two um, before we conclude the semester. Typically, lectures at 12 takes me about two lectures. So today and Tuesday, and then we'll probably start uh, lecture set 13, which is on multiple linear regression um, next Thursday. Assignment number six is devoted to regression analysis. So assignment six, which I posted yesterday, uh, will cover materials from lecture set 12 and lecture set number 13. And I think we should be in a position where you'll be able to get the majority of that lecture set or that assignment done by the end of next week. And then there'll just be a few little things that we have to tidy up um, before the due date. Okay, so with that being said, um, I started recording. We have a few people, uh, so we'll get going. Okay, so this lecture set is largely meant to be review of the materials that were covered in STAT 151. So simple linear regression is a topic that is discussed in STAT 151, though um, depending on when you took the course, you may not have seen it. So if you had taken STAT 151 a couple of years ago, for example, um, when COVID first sort of uh, reared its face, we a lot of the STAT 151 courses didn't get to regression analysis due to the, um, the move to online teaching. But if you have taken it within the last three semesters, I think you probably would have seen it. Nonetheless, we're going to go over um, the, the approach today. And we're through lecture set 12, we're gonna talk about a number of different topics that you may have seen beforehand, but if you haven't seen them, that's fine. Uh, it's a pretty thorough review of the topic. Okay, so the first thing is just what is the purpose of regression analysis? Pretty straightforward idea. We have a response variable, yi, same as we did with the ANOVA experiments or even in the kruskal wallace experiment. So we have some numeric response and we want to model it as a function of some explanatory variable. Now, the way that this, the, um, this differs from ANOVA because the explanatory variable is not categorical in these particular contexts or in these um, illustrations. So with the ANOVA, we had really the same situation. You have a response variable, and then you have some categorical variable that we called X. Um, and, we're, and we wanted to basically check to see how Y, the response variable, changes at each level of that categorical variable. And then what would happen is we would start considering the mean of Y at each category, and we studied the difference between the means. With regression analysis, what we are doing is we are saying we have some response variable Y, we have a explanatory variable X, but X is continuous. And we want to study the relationship between y and x. And the goal is to try and describe it. So can we build a function that tells us how y is going to change with the explanatory variable x? So simple linear regression is a way that we can do this. But in general, regression analysis refers to the suite of techniques that are used to link a, a continuous response variable to a set of continuous or categorical explanatory variables. So ANOVA 
one way ANOVA in particular, but all of the ANOVAs we've talked about, they are actually special cases of regression analysis. Simple linear regression is the simplest type of regression analysis. It refers to the situation where you have one response and one explanatory variable that is continuous. So in all of the regression analysis techniques that we are going to talk about, we will always have only one continuous response. But once we move beyond one continuous explanatory variable, we then move into multiple regression analysis. And in multiple regression analysis, you can actually mix the types of explanatory variables in the data set. So you could have continuous variables only, or categorical variables only, or a mixture of both. But with simple linear regression, we are, we are specifically talking about the case where we have one continuous response and one continuous explanatory variable. And we're just trying to link the two together. All right, so this is the model for simple linear regression. And you can see that it's actually quite similar to the ANOVA model. So what we are going to assume is that our response variable yi is a function of xi, and there are two variables in the model, beta naught, which is called the y-intercept, and beta one, which is called the slope. So this symbol here is pronounced beta. And actually, I think we've seen beta before because we had it in two-way ANOVA as well. In two-way ANOVA, we had alpha beta. But um, just for memory's sake, so this is beta. So when I'm saying beta naught, I mean the beta subscript zero. And this is the y, the true or the population y-intercept. And beta one is the true or population slope. Just like with the ANOVA models, we attach an error term. So the epsilon i on the end of the equation one here, that represents a normally distributed error. And the purpose of this term is basically just to say that the relationship between y and x is not perfect. So we don't have all of the values sitting exactly on the line. There's some deviation among the line. And I'll explain what that means more momentarily. Okay, when we want to use a simple linear regression model to describe the relationship between y and x, we make four assumptions. The first assumption is that the relationship is actually linear, okay? So we can think about the first assumption in the following way. So one of the nice things about simple linear regression is that you can visualize the problems and you can visualize them just using basic scatter plots. So beside uh, one here, where I'm going to illustrate what I mean by a linear relationship, I, have, I always have y on the y-axis and x on the x-axis. Okay, so y is the response variable as defined before, and it's a function of x. Okay, so when, um, when we talk about there being a linear relationship, what we mean is if we were to plot y versus x, it would look like a straight line could actually go through the data. So suppose you had something like this. If we were to draw a straight line through this, maybe something like this. Okay, we would probably argue 
appears that the line gives a reasonable fit. Okay, so straight line goes through middle of data, okay, or data follow the straight line. Okay. So the first assumption is actually very easy to check. Basically, all we have to do is make a scatter plot of our response variable and our explanatory variable. And then we just have to say, we just have to look at it and go, does it look like I could put a line through that data? And if I can put a line through it, then the first assumption is checked off. Whereas if we had something that looks like, oh, here's a color I've never used. So suppose that we had something that looks like this. Uh, I need to stagger them a bit because it's increasing values, right? Okay, so suppose that this was another set of data we have. Okay, in this case, the straight line really isn't going to fit very well. So if we try to put the line through this, maybe I'll exaggerate it a little bit more just to try and really bring home the idea. So if we try to put a line through this, we're gonna get something that looks like, maybe we'll get something that looks like the following. Oh, sorry, here, I'll use a different color here. Okay, maybe we get something that looks like this. And what we can see here is that those purple points are really not following the green line. In fact, it looks more like the purple points are kind of curved, right? So they're sort of, um, they're, they're, they're twisted around the line. So the second illustration is a case where we really don't see a straight line relationship, but we see kind of like a curve relationship and, or like a parabolic, half parabolic relationship. And in that situation, um, what we would say is, it doesn't actually seem like the data form a straight line relationship or Y and X don't appear to be linear with each other. They appear to have more of a, a quadratic or hyper or curve parabolic relationship. So a line would not be appropriate here because the, the relationship is not linear. Okay. So Okay, so I have in green here, the relationship between those purple points does not appear to be linear. It's more of a curve. So a straight line model like the SLR model is not appropriate, right? You can't, you don't, the point is, when we use an SLR model or any regression model, we are assuming linearity between Y and X. So if you plot a scatter plot of Y and X and it doesn't look to be linear, it looks like maybe it has a curve to it or some other non straight line relationship, we don't want to use this approach. The same way we don't want to use a T test if we can't show normality, we don't want to use a straight line when the data is not linear. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. 
not seeing any. Okay, now <laughs> the next two assumptions are more traditional assumptions in the sense that we're talking about parameters of the error term. So we can use a similar illustration to try and um, state this point. Okay, so for the second and third assumption, this is my plot of y versus x. So this is my scatter plot. Now I've just arbitrarily drawn a line on the plot. You can draw this any way that you want. I've just drawn a positively sloped line. Beta zero is the point where the line intersects the y axis. That's the definition of beta zero. So in every situation, beta zero is always going to be the point where the line intersects the y-axis. For example, if you were to draw another line up here, ah, <laughs> sorry. If you were to draw another line up here like this, okay, this would be beta zero for that line. And it's still perfectly valid. So it doesn't matter where the line starts on the y-axis, and it doesn't matter if the line goes up or down. It's the same thing. Okay. All right. So the way that the second and the third assumptions, or what the second and the third assumptions mean in the context of regression analysis. Suppose we have a point x that sits on the x-axis. So we're going to call that point x1. X1, the value of X1 on the line is given by this dot shown here. Okay, so this dot here has value beta zero plus beta one X one. Okay, so that's what that point is equal to. It's equal to the Y intercept plus the slope of the line plus or times x1. Okay, the assumptions two and three state that um, the error term is normally distributed and has constant variance. In the context of our simple linear regression model, what that means is that around this point on the line, we have a normal distribution, okay? And the midpoint of that normal distribution is the point on the line. So the mean of this distribution is beta zero plus beta one X, okay? And then this normal curve has sigma squared has variance sigma squared. Okay. So this is basic, basically what the second and the third assumption are telling us is that for any point X that exists in the system, when we plug X into the regression line, the value beta zero plus beta one X one, which is actually Y one. This value is going to be normally distributed and it's going to have a variance equal to Sigma square. Now, if we were to consider another point X two, what would happen here? I'm just gonna let me drag. Okay, so if we consider another point x2, 
we would have the value on the line. And this value is going to also be normally distributed with the same variance. So sigma squared again. But the midpoint, so the point on the line is changing because of x2. And that same trend will continue no matter what value of x3 you are considering or what value of x you are considering. So if we consider x3 now, okay, so this curve still has variant sigma square. It's still normal, but now the mean is y3. Which is beta zero plus beta one x three. Okay. Any questions? All right, the fourth assumption is simply just independence of the observation. So we write it in terms of the error. So we're saying the error terms are independent of one another. The reason for this is because we use residual analysis to evaluate the assumptions. And well, I'll talk more about this a bit later too, and you'll be shown how to do this in lab. But in summary, when we wanna use a simple linear regression model, the first thing is we have one continuous response and we have one continuous explanatory variable. If we plot the response against the explanatory variable, we would want to see a linear pattern. That's the first assumption. The second assumption, when we, or the second and the third assumption are that when we use a simple linear regression model, every single point on the fitted line is assumed to have a normal distribution with the same variance. Okay, so moving across the fitted line or that population line, depending on how you want to think about it. So let's say moving across the population line, whichever direction it's going, the center of the distribution at each value of X changes, but they are all normal with the same variance. All right. Now this has value that we are going to see later when we talk about inference for the line. So the normality assumption, of course, is going to mean that we can make certain assumptions about the distribution of the test statistics that we're going to talk about, and we can build different types of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests um, for a, about, the fit, about the fitted line or about the population line. And the fact that everything's normal just means that things are going to work out pretty well in terms of what distributions we work with. Okay. All right, now... Before we get to all that, we need to actually talk about how we, act, we, we work with a line. So how do we build the line? All right. So given that we have a data set with one continuous response and one explanatory variable, and they're both continuous, and we look at the scatter plot and we say, okay, this looks to be linear. I want to fit a line to the data set. The line that we are going to fit has the expression given in equation two. So we're going to say y hat i. So this is the estimate of y. Oh, actually, I have that below. OK, so y hat i is the estimated value of y. The hat, whenever you see this little hat sitting on top of a value, this is the hat. The hat means estimate of, okay? So whenever you see this little symbol, it means estimated value. So we're gonna say the estimated value of Y is equal to B0, which is the estimate of the Y intercept, plus B1, which is the estimate of the slope, times XI, which is the value, basically the values that we have for X in the data set. Okay, so this, Equation in two is the estimate of the SLR model given in equation one. 
So we are going to calculate B0 and B1 using the data, and then we can plug values of X into the line to get out a value of Y. <clears throat> okay, fitting uh, the linear regression equation in, in, from the previous slide is actually very easy. Just for a little bit of background, it's done through a process called least square, uh, least, it's done through what's called the least squares criteria, which basically just means that B0 and B1 are the result of trying to make the errors as small as possible. Okay, so recall that we defined those errors, epsilon i, to be normally distributed values. What the, and the estimate of the error is simply the difference between the true value of y that we have in the data set we are working with and the estimated value of y from the fitted line. So what we are trying to do is make that quantity, this little ei term, as small as possible. In particular, to do this, what we do is we consider the square of ei and we want to minimize that. So basically, we're what we're trying to do is find the line that sits as close to all of the data points as possible. That's the purpose of this criteria. So we're just trying to find a line that basically goes right through the middle of the data points that we are working with and is as close to every single point as possible. So from the least square criteria, we can derive estimates for B0 and B1, which are shown below. So both of them are actually quite easy to compute. You'll notice that B0 is equal to Y bar minus B1 X bar. So the first thing we always work out is B1, which is the slope or the estimate of the population slope. Once we have B1, which is given by SXY over SXX, where SXY and SXX, they are given in the little table below. They're just basically measures of square difference around the mean for the x and the y values. So they're, they're numerators for a variance term, essentially. So once we have SXY and SXX, we can easily compute B1. And then once we have B1, we can compute B0 just by computing the mean of y bar and the mean of x bar. OK, okay so. We'll start off by looking at an illustration of these calculations, and then we'll talk about what the calculations actually mean in the context of the problems that we're working with. All right, so to illustrate these values or the calculation of the line, we're going to use a um, data set that has 15 observations, and the 15 observations represent the midterm mark that university students got um, after they wrote the midterm. And we're trying to model their mark as a function of how many hours they slept the night before the test. So our two variables are sleep in hours and midterm mark. Okay. Now you can see from the scatter plot that midterm mark is being designated as the y value. Okay and sleep is being designated as the X value. Okay. And you can see the same thing here because we have midterm mark on the Y axis and we have sleep on the X axis. Okay. All right. All right, so we want to model midterm mark as a function of the number of hours of sleep. We have our scatter plot here. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask, does it seem like the relationship is linear? All right, well, let's say that I draw a straight line through this data set, maybe something like this. And then the question is, does it look like the points appear to follow the, the straight line pattern? And I think, you know, for the purpose of the illustration, 
and realistically based off of how the 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 marks are associated with sleep it does appear like this relationship is somewhat linear so we can say here there's no evidence to suggest the relationship is not linear. Okay, so there isn't any reason to believe that we do not have a linear relationship here. It's maybe it's not a perfect fit. I mean, there's no arguing that the points could certainly be maybe a little bit closer to that line, but it doesn't seem like there's any curvature or non egregious nonlinearity. So we can proceed by fitting an S, uh, a, a regression model, and we can assume that that relationship is linear. Okay, so we have the number of hours of sleep, and we have the midterm mark, which we defined as X and Y. All right, now what we need to do are compute those summary statistics. So we need the mean of Y, we need the mean of X, and we need those SXY, SXX, SYY terms. We don't really need SYY, but for illustration, we'll show it anyways. Or maybe we won't. <laughs> okay. So in the following table, I have my XI values and I have my YI values. Now, this table is illustrating the process of computing the SXX and the SXY term. So, first off, you'll notice here I have 4.6 minus 5.52. So this is telling us that the mean of X, so X bar, which is the sum from I equals one to N of XI divided by N is equal to 5.52, okay? So if I add all the X values together and divide by 15, I get 5.52. So that's the definition of the mean. All right, now to compute SXX, I need to take the sum from I equals one to N of XI minus X bar squared. So you can see how that process works. We take each value of X, we subtract the mean. So the second column is showing us 4.6 minus 5.52, and then 8.5 minus 5.52, 3.2 minus 5.52, and then we continue with that pattern. Okay, so we're just taking each value of X, subtracting the mean, and then we square that term. So you can see 4.6 minus 5.52 is negative 0 0.92 squared. And then 8.5 minus 5.52 is 2.98, and then we square that. 3.2 minus 5.52 is negative 2.32, and then we square that. Okay, and we do that for every value, and then we add them all together, and that gives us 77.544. So the SXX value is 77.544. Okay. okay, to compute SXY, we need Y bar. So you can see from the values above, y bar, which is the sum from i equals one to little n, y i over n is equal to 71.8. All right, then we're gonna compute y i minus y bar. So the same idea. So we just take each value and subtract the mean. So 68 minus 71.8, for example, 83 minus 71.8, etc. SXY is the sum of the product of XI minus X bar and YI minus Y bar. So SXY is equal to the sum I equals one to N YI minus Y bar, or sorry, XI minus X bar, same thing. Okay, and that gives us 
457.66. Right. So just some illustrations on how to compute those values. Hopefully this is fairly familiar to you. We've seen a lot of terms uh, with this type of calculation already. Um, we've done lots of variance calculations, for example, through the ANOVA. These are still just numerators of a variance term. All right, so we have SXX, we have SYY, we have Y bar, and we have X bar. All right, so we want to fit, so we want to find B0 and B1 for YI hat is equal to B0 plus B1 XI. So B1 is equal to SXY divided by SXX. So this is going to be 457.66 divided by 77.5. Four, four, which gives us 5.902. Okay. B0 is Y bar minus B1 X bar. So that's going to be 71.8 minus 5.902 multiplied by 5.52. And that gives us 39.221. Okay, so therefore, y hat i is equal to 39.221 minus 5 point, or sorry, plus 5.902 xi. Right? And this is actually the solution to the problem. Any questions? <laughs> Okay, so here is the actual, here's the line that we just calculated superimposed on the scatter plot. Okay, so we can't really illustrate the y intercept because we don't have a value of zero on the um, x axis. But let's suppose for illustration purposes, we're moving by twos. So let's suppose that we extended this axis a bit. Okay, so here's 40 and here is zero. I'll try this one more. Okay. So let's suppose that we extended the axis a bit. Okay, so this point right here on the line, right where x is zero, this would be b0 equals 39.221. Okay, so b0 is the value where the line crosses the x-axis. All right, the slope, you can actually see the slope uh, through the following illustration. So suppose we have x is equal to 5 here. Okay. 
So this is the point where x equals four. And then we draw a straight line over to five. Okay. And this is the point where x equals five. And we draw a straight line over to six. Okay. So the slope is basically the increase in the value of y for every one unit change in x. Okay, so here we have four, five, six, right? So one unit change, one unit change. Okay, so this value here is B1 equals 5.902. And this value here is B1 equals 5.902. Okay. So the change in the Y for every one unit change in X, that's what the slope represents. So the slope is telling us how much the mark increases for every additional hour that we sleep the night before the test. Okay. And B0 is telling us the value of Y, so the midterm mark, when X equals zero. So this is what we would expect to get on the test if we did not sleep the night before. Any questions? Okay, so the scatter plot indicates that the more hours a student sleep, the better they can expect their midterm mark to be, which seems logical. We know that sleep is beneficial for a number of reasons. Um, you know, memory reten or retention of information, um, clear thinking, better mood, all these sort of things. So it would make sense that a performance on some sort of written test would improve on average with sleeping more the night before the test. Wink, wink, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. This interpretation is supported by the line. So the slope is a positive number. So the, the slope being positive means that the line is going up. So whenever the slope is positive, that indicates that X increasing leads to Y increasing as well. In particular, the slope is telling us that we can expect a student's mark to increase by 5.9% for every additional hour they sleep. Okay, so the slope is telling us, again, how Y goes up or how Y changes with a one unit change in X. So every time we increase X by one, Y increases by 5.9. So in the context of the problem, for every additional hour the student sleeps, their expected grade increases by 5.9%. B0 is stating the expected mark if a student does not sleep the night before the test. Okay, so if a student gets zero hours of sleep, the grade that we would expect to assign them is 39.3%. Any questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so we fitted the line what are some of the things that we can do with it? Well, one of the main things we can do is write interpretations like those given on slide 12. Okay. Another thing we can do is use the line for prediction. So 
this is one of the most common um, usages of a fitted regression model. I now have a representation of the system. So I'm saying everything follows a straight line pattern where the line has B0 and B1, which I can calculate. I can use this line to estimate the value of Y for any given value of X. For example, suppose that I only slept four hours the night before the test or some student only slept four hours and they wanna know what kind of grade they should expect given only number of hours of sleep. Using our line, we can write yi hat is equal to 39.221 uh, plus 5.902 xi. Okay, so yi hat. So this means that for four hours of sleep, 39.221. I'll write it like this. So we have our fitted line. And then we have when x is equal to four, we take our line and we just plug four in for x. It's very straightforward. Okay, so then that gives us uh, 62.83. So we can say, we expect a student that slept four hours the night before the test to um, receive a grade of 62.83%. So that's one of the primary um, usages, I guess you could say, of the regression, of any regression model is prediction, right? So we're trying to, you know, in some, we're, we're trying to make reasonable conclusions about how the value of Y is influenced by the value of X and then use, uh, for example, a straight line model to try and infer the values of Y from a given value of X. Any questions? Okay, once we have fitted the model, it's very clear, especially a simple model because there's only one value of X. It's very clear that making predictions based off the model is very is easy to do. Like you're, we're basically just multiplying and adding or subtracting a value. Now, given that it's easy, it doesn't mean that we should always do it. For example, in the illustration we just looked at, we chose a value of X is equal to four x equals to four exists within what we actually observed. So if we go back and we look at the values of x in the scatter plot, you can see that x ranges from roughly 1.5 to 10.5. And the mean of x was around 5.5. So a value of four is not very far from the mean of what we actually observed. Furthermore, at a value of four exists within what we can see. Okay, so we can see between 1.5 and 10.5 for values of X. So four is in between those quantities. One of the drawbacks of these fitted models 
is that we can only observe the linear relationship between what we can actually see. We don't know if the relationship holds once we get beyond what we have observed, okay? So when we are using the line for prediction, it's always best to use values of X that exist within what we have actually observed in the data set. Once we move outside of those values, we are practicing what is called extrapolation. And extrapolation can be dangerous because we, again, we don't know if, for example, the linear relationship is still there outside of what we have actually seen. So for example, suppose we have, the following scatter plot. Now, let's suppose that between this value and this value, we observed a linear relationship. So maybe something looks like this. So we fitted a straight line to this data. This is what we actually observed. Okay, so this is what we have seen. Now, we might say, um, okay, well, let's plug in a value outside of what we have seen. So maybe we have another quantity over here. Okay. Okay, so maybe we want to plug in X for this unobserved quantity. It might be fine. Maybe the relationship continues to be linear. We get lucky. But it could also be the case that once we get past this value of x, maybe everything flatlines, right? And starts to go like this. So the straight line model that we had fitted within the observed part, that no longer holds. So these are unobserved but true, okay, so this is unobserved, meant to illustrate the true relationship does not continue to be linear. Yeah, I can't spell unobserved. Unobserved. There we go. <laughs> okay. So it could be fine, but the point is we don't know what happens outside of what we have seen. So let's say, for example, outside of what we have seen, as shown by the blue points, everything flatlines, and you're using a straight line to illustrate a point that should be over here. So the model no longer fits. So that could mean that we get a very bad interpretation, or we get an estimate that's completely off. Another example might be that maybe once we get past the observed part, everything drops down fairly rapidly like this. So this is another example of linearity not holding outside observed values. Okay. 
So the point is, again, extrapolation refers to when we are using a value of X that we have not seen within the data set. The biggest problem with extrapolation is that we don't know if the linear relationship still holds outside what we have seen. So if we start plugging in values of X that we don't, that we, we haven't observed, they could lead to horribly wrong estimates. Because again, we don't know if the pattern that we first observed holds as we continue to grow or shrink the values of X. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Um, okay, so the next part, now that we have learned how to fit the line and we have an understanding of the basic um, interpret the, the, how to interpret the line. So what B, B0 is and what B1 is. The next questions that we're gonna ask are, um, how well does the line actually fit the data? So we have our data set, we fitted a line to it, how can we evaluate the line? How can, what can we say about that line to um, confirm or deny that it fits well? So there's a lot of different ways that we can actually answer this question. And we're gonna talk about a number of them as we move on. For example, we can evaluate the assumptions, which we should do obviously. That would be the first thing. If the assumptions hold, that gives evidence that using the line is appropriate. But we can also use what are called diagnostic measures. So diagnostic measures are basically quantities um, that they're, they're quantities whose values imply good or bad fit, essentially. OK, the most common diagnostic measure for a regression model is called the coefficient of determination. And the coefficient of determination is essentially a ratio of two variances. Well, sorry, it's a ratio of two sums of squares, right? So you'll recall, hopefully you'll recall from our study of ANOVA that the ANOVA model takes total variation and breaks it up into different components. So for example, with the um, one-way ANOVA, we took total variation and we broke it up into, um, uh, we broke it up into the treatment variation or the, the sum of square treatment and the error variation or sum of square error. The regression model has the same interpretation. So we can take total variation in the response, which is SST, and we can break it up into two components, SS error, so the SSE, and SSR, which is the SS regression. So basically, what we are doing here is we are saying total variation in the response variable can be represented by the regression model and how far away the points are from the regression model. So the bigger SSR is, the better the line fits. Because the bigger SSR is, the more of the total variation or the total sum of square it has absorbed. Okay, so if we have our response variable, and the response variable has so much variation in it, but the regression line accounts for say like 95% of that, that implies that it fits really well because it's, it's taking into account all of the information um, or 95% of the information that's available in the response. All right, now in terms of calculation, SST is the same thing as SST T from an ANOVA analysis. It's literally just the sum of square around the response variable. SSR can be found using the equation shown below. So we have um, xi yi minus xi yi over n divided by xi squared over xi squared all over n. Okay. So actually what we can show is that this thing is the same as syy. And this thing is simply S X Y squared over S X 
x. Okay, so given that we understand how to use these sum of squares, so the bigger SSR is, the better the line is fitting. We can build a measure that simply divides SSR by SST. And this is the definition of the coefficient of determination. So the coefficient of determination is, a, is literally just a number or a, a percentage or a fraction that represents amount of variation explained by the line. So since SST is equal to SSR plus SSE, the coefficient of variation is also equal to one minus SSE over SST. So there's two ways to compute the same value. We can do SSR over SST, or we can do one minus SSE over SST. Okay, now, Given the construction of the value, it follows that R squared is bounded between zero and one. So the lowest value R squared can take on is zero, which would mean that the line does not explain anything. So it's a terrible fit. And the highest value it can take on is one, which means that every single point sits on the line. Okay, so an R squared of one means perfect fit. An R squared of zero means doesn't fit at all. So now we have an understanding of how to interpret the value. So the closer R squared is to one, the better the fit. The closer R squared is to zero, the worse the fit. And then in between those values, you can kind of come up with like your own sort of subjective descriptions, like ranging from excellent to very good, to good, to moderate, to um, weak, to poor kind of idea. Okay, so we can talk a little bit about that as well. So for example, R squared equals one is perfect fit. Um, 0 0.9 less than or equal to R squared less than one would be excellent fit. 0 0.8 less than R squared less than 0 0.9 would be very good fit, 0 0.7 less than R squared less than 0 0.8 would be good fit, 0 0.6 less than or equal to R squared less than or equal to 0 0.7 would be moderate fit, 0 0.5 less than or equal to R squared less than or equal to 0 0.6 would be uh, weak fit. And basically anything less than 0 0.5 would be a poor fit. And then r squared equals 0 is no fit. So again, it's somewhat subjective, right? Like excellent versus very good versus good. These are all just terms that, I mean, you can interchange them. Some people are not as strict. Like they might say very good is above 0 0.7 or 0 0.75. Like it's not, there isn't actually a defined system for how to interpret R squared outside of R squared equal one being perfect and R squared equals zero being no fit. So you can range in how you describe them, but this is, an idea of what you might say depending on the value you observe. All right. Now, there's another value that we can that we can use to assess a linear fit, and that's called the correlation coefficient, little r, which is actually just the square root of r squared. Now, this is not actually a diagnostic measure because you can compute little r without fitting a model. The correlation coefficient is simply a measure of linear strength or linear relationship between x and y. But it follows that if the correlation coefficient is very close to one or negative one and far from zero, that a straight line model would work well because it's a measure of linear correlation. 
So it doesn't directly assess the line, but it would imply that a line would work well, okay? Now, unlike r squared, little r is bounded between negative one and one because you can have a linear relationship that's negative, but a perfectly good fit. So if you have a slope that's going down and all the points sit on the line, sorry, all the points sit on the line, that would be a perfect relationship. It's just in the negative direction. So r equal to negative one has the same meaning as r equal to one. They both describe perfectly or perfect linear relationship or the strongest possible linear correlation between x and y. The only difference is the direction that the relationship is heading. So little r will always have the same sign as the slope. So if B1 is positive, R is positive. If B1 is negative, R is negative, okay? And then you can use a very similar interpretation scheme as that given above, except that you would, at R equals one, you have perfect, um, you have a perfect positive correlation. At R negative one, you have a perfect negative correlation. And then you can kind of just range your interpretation based off of the same percent, the same percentiles we talked above, except you have positive and negative um, slopes. Okay, so for the illustration, um, we can show the computation of R and R squared. These are done by computing the sum of squares that we, were, we discussed when we introduced the R squared measure. So here we have our definition of SSR, here we have our definition of SS, or sorry, this is SSE. Here we have SSR, and here we have SST. So you can see the way that the plot is illustrated, or the way the diet, or the way the table, sorry, is illustrated is the same as the one we went through before when I talked about SYY or SXX and SXY. So I won't spend too much time going over what the table is showing you, but it's these are just illustrations of how you would calculate each of those sums of squares. Okay. And you can also use the formulas we talked about before. So this value here is the same thing as SYY, for example. Okay, so those are equivalent. And then here, if we wanted SSR, we could do SXY squared over SXX. That would be another way of getting it. All right, so for the model that we fitted, okay, so for yi hat equals 39.221 plus 5.902 xi. Okay. We can show that the r squared is equal to the SSR over the SST which is uh, 2,701.08 divided by 3,286.4, which is equal to uh, 0.8219. Okay, so therefore, the fitted SLR model provides a very good fit for the data. And then we can say specifically, so interpretation of R squared We would write 82.19% of the variation in the response variable is explained by the fitted model.
Okay. All right, and then to get r, this is very easy. So r is just plus or minus the square root of r squared. So this is plus or minus the square root 0 0.8219. So this is going to be plus or minus 0 0.9066. And then we would say, since b1 is positive, R is positive, so R equals 0 0.9066. Okay, so therefore, um, we have evidence of a excellent positive linear um, we have evidence of an excellent positive linear correlation In part B, it asks, uh, determine the percentage of variation in the observed values of the response explained by the regression line. So this is actually kind of a trick. Part B is basically just asking you, what is R squared? Okay, so this is saying, so the answer, is 82.19%. So it's just asking you for R squared as a percentage. And the purpose of that question is just to reinforce the interpretation of R squared. So R squared is used to assess fit, but we can also use it to provide, um, but it also has its own direct meaning in the context of the variation explained. All right. Any questions? Okay. All right. So now that we've gone through and illustrated those different diagnostic measures, the next thing I want to do is just reinforce what we can expect when we are using R and R squared to assess linear fit. So I'm going to do that using some scatter plots. I'm just going to sketch out a couple of different relationships so we can get an idea of um, what to expect in terms of values of R and R squared, depending on the shapes that Y and X form with one another. Okay, so the first and most obvious um, concept, so if this is B0, okay, so if every single point falls directly on the line, okay, so this would be a scatter plot of X0, Y0, 
x1, y1, etc. This is an illustration where we would have r squared equal to one and r equal to one. Okay, so when r squared and r are both one, it just means that every point is sitting exact is sitting right on top of the line. There's no variation. Everything is perfectly linear. And then it follows that if you had something that looks like this, And so here we would have r squared is one, but r is equal to negative one, right? So same idea, it's a perfect fit. r being negative one is not a bad thing. It just means that the slope is going down, but it's still a perfect fit, right? Now, on the contrary, I'll write them over here just to like kind of work our way down. Suppose that you had something that is very clearly nonlinear. So there's a lot of different illustrations that you can use. I, I'm just going to use a sort of like an um, uh, a um, rainbow type shape. Just trying to think of the word rainbow there. Okay, so maybe you have something that looks like this. All right, you're going to try and fit a line to this. It's going to be impossible. The line is just going to go kind of right through the middle as such. This would be an illustration where R is effectively zero and r squared is effectively zero. So the little squiggly lines, that means approximately, okay? And it's just because it might not be like exactly zero, it might be like 0 0.0003, but it's basically zero for all intents and purposes. Okay, okay now essentially what's gonna happen is the r and r squared values, they'll just slowly drop from one to zero as the points spread away from the line. So for example, suppose we have something that looks like this. So the points are still quite close, but they're not exactly on the line, but the relationship is still linear. This might be, for example, r squared is uh, 0.81 and little r is approximately 0 0.9. Okay. And then it would be the same idea. If it went negative, you would have just a negative r squared. But say, like, for example, um, you know, the points get even further away from the line, something like this, right? So we're just gonna get a bigger drop. So maybe R squared here. So we'll have negative 0. I don't know, six. Maybe that's a little too harsh. Maybe we'll say like negative 0. 0.7. No, it's still gonna be too harsh. We'll say negative 0. 0.8. So the R squared is gonna be around 0. 0.64. Right, so basically what we're showing is essentially like what the R squared is telling you is how far away the points are from the line. Once we get down to R squared of zero, this is basically, this is just saying there is no linear fit. All right, and then maybe we really start to kind of flat line as the last example. So the slope of the line is really getting close to zero now. And we have a lot of spread, maybe something like this, almost to the point where it doesn't even look linear. So this might be like an R squared, I don't know, we'll say negative 0 0.2, and the R squared is gonna be 0 0.04, for example. Maybe that's a bit too harsh, get a little more. Uh, gradient in there. Maybe something like that. Right. Okay, so I will uh, stop here for today. And um, just a reminder that assignment five is due tomorrow evening.
That's the non-parametric unit. Assignment six is due April one, which is the regression unit. And um, on next week, we'll be back in the in the room for lecture. So I'll see you guys in class on Tuesday. I have office hours tomorrow. And um, yeah, take care. Have a nice weekend.